we'll have a little break after that, and then we'll get a question and answer, and we'll see what people have got to say from all the people sitting about. Can I just uh, quickly ask how many people are local people, Shelton, Toll Cross, and everything? Right, there we are. Okay, and how many people's travelled out? I know this woman over here, right? And this woman came from Tarbert. From Tarbert, my man here. From your head? Yeah. Your head, and over here with visitors from Mr. House and the West End. Where it's to get Go on, take your chandeliers today. Well, that's really, that's really interesting. We've got people travelling from all over as far as Tarbert from your head and for the, the, the lofty lanes of the West End as well to come to this meeting here. Uh, in Shettleson. Um We'll get things rolling then because we've, uh, we're a little bit delayed there with technical stuff and all that nonsense. So uh, we're going to kick off and I'm going to ask the first person to I want to ask to, to speak here is, uh, would describe myself I think as a son of the parish. Uh, it was in fact this man's idea to have this meeting about this topic held here in Shettleson. So I'd ask you to give a ripple of appreciation well for a few minutes we hear from Mr Donald Reed. Donald. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you for coming. Um, just before we begin, I wonder if I can take a wee straw poll, um, if you don't mind. I mean, if you might, might, might not want to say what your position is, but how many people are inclined to vote yes or thinking about it? Anybody thinking of voting no? Anybody undecided? Okay. Well, <laughs> Anyway, thanks very much everyone for coming. I mean, it's really important that we have a thorough debate so that when we wake up on the 19th of September, we feel we have the best go at it we possibly can. Um, and that's why I thought it was important to meet here. Um, this is the area I come from, and I was really keen, having been to one of these events before in the south side, that we do something here. Um, so I just want you to think about 18th of September, seven months away enough. I mean, it's going to be a long seven months. But on that day, 18th September, from the moment the polls open at, what, 7 in the morning until they close at 10 at night, um, the eyes of the world are going to be upon us. Um, so, you know, all this talk about sovereignty and power, in those 13 hours, the power is in your hands to determine the answer to the question, should Scotland become an independent country? Um, and there's a lot of propagandising and fear-mongering about why it shouldn't be. I mean, if you noticed every day, there's another, just another wee drip feed of another scare story about the lottery, or about pensions, or about roaming charges, or about driving on the right-hand side of the road, etc., etc., etc. Just enough to sow that wee seed of doubt in your mind to make people feel, oh, it's too risky. So I just want to turn the other, th turn it the other way around. Imagine that on the 18th of September, instead of voting to become independent. Let's just imagine for the moment that we are independent and the vote on the 18th of September was to form a union with what we call it England or the rest of the UK. That would mean we would be deciding whether or not to join a country which is ten times bigger than us and therefore even if all the Scottish MPs you know, uniformly represent our view um, they can still be outvoted by roughly 10 or 15 percent of the MPs from the bigger country. And as well as that, those MPs would be sitting in a parliament which is 400 or 500 or 600 miles away, depending on which part of Scotland you're in. And um, you know, they'd be, they'd, most of them would be voted under a, a system which isn't proportional. Secondly, we'd be joining a country which is up to his eyes in debt. You know how the Chancellor keeps telling us we've got great levels of debt, we are potentially a basket case unless we stick to this austerity programme. Well, we'd be joining that country, um, which is also running a huge balance of payment deficit, one of the worst in the world. And in order to find the money for that, is cutting spending on social programmes. In other words, hitting the poorest charging students for education, but still finds money for wars and for nuclear weapons because these are basically status symbols. Do you know that um, the UK, well we're talking about England here, in my imagined scenario, has, for the last 300 years, there's only been one year when we haven't been in a conflict somewhere in the world. Just one year out of 300. So that's the country we've been voting to join. 
also the country which is the fourth most unequal in the developed world and has an attitude nevertheless which is anti-European and anti-foreigner. Would you vote to join that? No. So, on 18th September we have the choice to say, sorry, we want to dissociate ourselves from that and as you'll guess, that's what I think we should do. Um, not only will those eyes be upon Scotland, they'll be upon this part of Glasgow. I don't know if you saw in the paper today, there's this wee article in the Guardian. Front page, bottom of the front page, Glasgow's East End, front line in the battle for Scotland. And all the pundits tell us that it will be here in the East End of Glasgow that the vote is won or lost. Um, because it's here that it's the unknown quantity, the people who maybe don't normally vote in elections, the people who maybe normally vote Labour but maybe feel a bit disgruntled, might go for independence and it's a bit of an unknown quantity. Um, so my second question to you as an audience is, are people talking about it where you are up your street or in your workplace? Are, are people talking about it? Yeah. Yeah. Not very many people saying yes. Put your hand up if people are talking about it where you are. Great, but well, we need more people talking about it and try to dispel some of the rubbish. So tonight's um, topic, just to be controversial, was you know, this idea that we're too wee, too poor, too stupid. I mean, if you're like me, you'd be brought up to believe we're too wee, too poor, too, stu too stupid. And although I've done economics and so on, um, I never really questioned that, that was true, but I've come to realise, as I've looked into this over the last few years, that it's not true. I mean, too wee, okay, you know, look at um, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, um, Austria, um, the Netherlands, Ireland, Iceland. Um, these are all countries comparable size, and they're not too wee to run their own affairs. Too poor? Well, all the countries I mentioned are richer than us, and they're all richer than the UK. And if we were independent, we'd be, well, by some calculations, eighth in the list of richest countries in the world. Too stupid? Scotland had the, an, an education system which was the envy of Europe a couple of hundred years ago, when we had a 75% literacy rate. We had four universities when England had only two. And now, uh, of the top 200 universities in the world, five of them are in Scotland. So proportionally, we have more top-class universities than any other country. And Scotland's got a long history of contribution to the world. We've now had a Scottish Parliament running for 13, 14 years. And, of course, the Scots went all over the world as part of the British Empire. So if we can run an empire, I think we can run a wee country in the periphery of Europe. Um, so that's my pitch. Uh, just to look like it's I'm pushing on a closed door here. Uh, but thank you for coming. And these are the guys here that are going to back up that idea with uh, some of the hard facts that we need to kind of get on top of to, um, to dispel the myths. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, my name is Ivan McKee. I'm a director of Business for Scotland, um, and I'm just going to talk you through first of all a bit about uh, me, my journey to Yes, because I wasn't always involved in the in the campaign, and then a few pointers on the the theme for tonight: too wee, too poor, too stupid? Question mark. Um, I started off, I studied engineering, then I went into work for different manufacturing companies for about 20 years, and then about 9 or 10 years ago I got a chance to start my own business. I got made redundant to somewhere, and I started up doing my own thing as a consultant, um, working with different businesses around, around Europe. Um, and one thing led to another, and eventually I, I got in a position where I got my own manufacturing businesses going, and I've, I've now got businesses in Scotland, England, and in Eastern Europe that I've built up over the last few years. Um, and um, about a year and a half, two years ago, when the referendum was announced, a bit after that, I thought I'd better have a look at some of the information around about it because, because I was working in different countries, England, Scotland and, and abroad, I thought I'd better find out what it would mean for my business. So what I did was I went and got hold of all the data, um, cut through all the spin, went right back to the original numbers to understand how I would look at this if this was a business I was looking at getting involved in, would it make sense to, 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 to go into this business or, or, or was it a basket case? Um, so I went to, into it with an open mind, looked at all the information, and what I found kind of surprised me, because I found that Scotland was actually a very wealthy country with a huge amount of potential, and if it was a business, you would definitely want to invest in it, because of the, 
very many strengths that it's got um, if it was a business. Um, and I'll talk you through some of that stuff just to um, the kind of journey I went through. Um, the first thing too, we, and uh, Donald's kind of talked about some comparable countries in Europe. If you actually look at the um, United Nations, um, there's uh, nearly 200 countries in the United Nations. There's about 100 of them are bigger than Scotland and about nearly 100 of them are smaller than Scotland. So in terms of country size, we're pretty much bang in the middle. And it's the same in Europe. If you look at all the countries that were in the, the draw for the, the, the Euro Championships on, on Sunday there, um, half of them, roughly about 24 or 25 of them, are smaller than Scotland and about the same number are bigger than Scotland. So we're kind of average sized country. We're not a teeny wee country like Iceland that's got 300,000 people or when I did a lot of work in Estonia, they've got just over a million people. Five and a half million people, so it's a good size for a country. Um, another thing about that is, um, as was mentioned, if you actually look at the richest countries in the world, most of them are about that size. Uh, about a five million kind of population, the top ten richest countries in the world, Norway, uh, Finland, Aust Austria, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, they're all in that kind of five to ten million size. And there's a reason for that, because countries that are that kind of size are easier to manage, they're easier to control, it's, um, the democracy's better because people are closer to the government and they can get decisions made faster that more represent what people are doing. Um, it's not a big cumbersome dinosaur like, uh, like big countries can be if they're not managed properly. Um, so that's kind of on the two, the two we side. On the two poor side, um, what I found when I looked at all the numbers was that um, Scotland's GDP, which is a kind of measure they use of how wealthy a country is, um, it was about 18%, nearly 20% higher than the UK average. Um, the amount of money that we generate in tax, and that includes all tax, corporation tax, fat, income tax, tax from the North Sea, the whole lot in Scotland, is £1,700 per person higher than the average in the UK. So this is a country that generates a lot of wealth, a lot of tax, um, a lot of economic activity. Um, and not just in oil, uh, we've got a food and drink sector that's, that's, that's much bigger per head than, than the UK average, obviously, because we've got, we've got um, fisheries, we've got, we've got whiskey, we've got, we've got all kinds of stuff. We've got a manufacturing sector that despite the, the industrialisation, is still a reasonable size, it should be a lot bigger than it is. Um, we've got a tourism sector that's much bigger than the UK average for, for the size of country we are. Um, and you go on and on through a whole bunch of industries, including a lot of new industries, um, like computer games, life sciences, all kinds of things that we're, we're developing the expertise in. So it's um, it's a country that's got a lot a lot of strengths, not just not just oil, as people would uh, often have you believe. Um, and if you look at our public sector finances, um, Scotland's public sector finances are in a healthier state than the UK average. We generate nearly 10% of the total tax that gets sent to, 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 to the UK essentially, and with only 8.5% of the population, we get back just over 9% of the spend. So we're sending more money south than we're getting back. And that's a real eye-opener for a lot of people when you actually explain that to them because a lot of people are brought up to believe that well, we can't afford things if it wasn't for Westminster or London sending us money we wouldn't be able to afford anything, etc, etc. And you have to ask yourself the question, if that was the case and they were having to subsidise us, why are they so keen to hang on to us? Um, which is kind of obvious when you think about it. Um, and just a couple other pointers on that. Um, one of the things that's often talked about is the banks and we couldn't afford to bail out the banks and that's a real con because the way banks work is if a bank goes bust it gets bailed out by the countries that the it does business not where the nameplate is 90 percent of rbs's activity is in the city of london it's the trading desks and all that kind of stuff there's only 10 percent of the global employees of rbs are actually in scotland uh, each boss is effectively run out of halifax um so uh, when you actually look at that and they say they're scottish banks it's a lot of nonsense. I and mean, the biggest bailout of the British banks in total actually came from the US Fed. They put about um, nearly a trillion dollars in to the bailout, which is about the same kind of number as the total that the UK government put in. Um, and there's been banks in Europe that have had bother and they've been bailed out by a number of different countries based on where they do business. So this idea that we would have had to bail out all these huge banks that were trading in the city of London and Nat West was part of RBS, so we should have had to bail out Nat West and had to bail out Halifax and the whole lot. It's just a lot of nonsense. What would have happened was we would have had to bail out the bit in Scotland, which is the bit we ended up paying for anyway through the taxes we sent down to, down to London. Um, 
So um, I got involved then with uh, Business for Scotland, which is an organisation. We've got about 1,500 members now, people from all sizes of business. Some employ thousands of people, some are one-man businesses doing whatever they're doing in the high street and everything in between. Um, so about 1,500 members and people are often surprised at that because they think business is going to be more unionist or whatever. But in reality, business people understand this because if you set your own business up, you have to go through the whole process of everybody telling you you can't do it, you're not locked out, you can't afford it, how are you going to live, how are you going to pay your mortgage? And you go through all of that, that process and then you get in a position where you're running your own affairs, you're making your own decisions, you're standing on your own two feet. Um, and business people understand the value of that. So when they look at Scotland as a country, trying to be independent, not dependent, trying to stand on its own two feet, make its own decisions for itself, um, that chimes with their kind of background in terms of where they've come from, from a business point of view. Um, and I'll finish up with a wee story because we're talking a lot about, um, about oil this week um, and the, uh, this is interesting, this is the second time that the UK cabinet has met in the north of Scotland in the last hundred years um, and the last time they met was in 1921 and the story was that Lloyd George, who was the Prime Minister, was on holiday in Inverness and they had a crisis to do Ireland and he called the cabinet up to Inverness to have a meeting. Um, so it's kind of ironic that 100 years ago they had a meeting to talk about Irish independence and this week they're up to talk about Scottish independence. Um, so but we're talking about oil, we always talk about Norway and I just want to run you through a wee, um, a wee story to, to do with Norway. And I, I know there's a real comedian on the, on the stage so I won't pretend this is a joke but you might want to laugh at the end. Um, the, uh, the Prime Minister of Norway was out for a, a wee walk down the fjord and um, he comes across a lamp, um, the magic lamp. So he gives it a rub and the genie comes out. And um, the genie says to him, I'll give you some wishes to make Norway a better place. And he thinks, well, we're just about the richest country in the world, we're the happiest country in the world, we've got all the health indicators, everything you like, we're, we're right up at the top. So I'm, I'm really struggling um, to think of something that, that I could wish for. And he said, well, well, think about it and see if you can think of a few things. And he thinks for a minute and he says, um, OK, so we've got, we've got a lot of oil industry and we've got a fishing industry, but apart from that, we haven't got much in the way of industry, so it'd be nice to have some other industries. Um, but we've got this national drink called Aquavit that nobody's ever heard of. Um, it would be really good if, um, if we could uh, market that and sell it around the world and everybody from Shanghai to Chicago would pay stupid money to, to take this drink off our hands and we were the only people in the world that could make it. And he says, well, yeah, we can do that for you. He says, we've got a real problem because we speak Norwegian, obviously. Nobody in the world speaks Norwegian apart from us, so we've always got to learn other languages to go and do business. Wouldn't it be great if everybody in the world spoke Norwegian and everywhere we went, we just had to speak Norwegian and they could do business with us? He said, oh, yeah, we, we can do that as well. Um, he said, we, we've got a real problem because we're kind of isolated. We're a long way away from our main markets to get to the centre of Europe to, to trade with people. We've got to go through, to, through, our, through two other countries and it's a real, a real problem. It'd be really good if we had a big kind of landmass just um, on a southern border, 60 million people that all spoke Norwegian and they all wanted to buy our, our national drink and buy our oil from us and our energy and etc etc. He says, yeah we, we can manage that as well. Um, he said, um, we're fairly new at this industry game, we only kind of started in the 60s when we started to learn about oil. Um, it'd be good if we had like 150 years of industrial heritage and we'd invented all kinds of things all over the world and our engineers were famous all over the world anywhere you went. He said, well we could probably manage that as well. Um, he said the land mass is a nightmare, it's like really big, if we had something that was maybe a fifth of the size but with the same amount of natural resources we could get places quicker, our infrastructure wouldn't cost as much, it'd be really a lot easier to manage, he said well we can, we can manage that as well. The weather's not great, it's like minus 35 in the winter, if we had a nice kind of mild temperature all the year round life would be a lot easier, we wouldn't have to get the snow plows out six months of the year, we can manage that as well. And um, he said well what would be really good is if we had tens of millions of people all over the world who could trace their ancestry back to Norway. They were wishing us well in the world. They wanted to help us go on in the world and, and do um, do what we want to do as an independent country. He says, yep, tick that box. Um, and he said, um, our brand's not, uh, not great. It would be really good if we had a, a national dress everybody in the world recognised, a national poet that everybody had um, celebrated every year, etc. And he says, yeah, we could probably manage that as well. And he said, um, there's one other thing, there was um, that Tartan Army were here last year and they beat us 1-0. Could you get us a better football team as well? <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Ivan McKee there. And uh, Ivan McKee just passes the microphone over to another representative from uh, Business for Scotland. So uh, some noise of appreciation for uh, Michelle, Michelle Thompson. Hi there. Good evening. Um, 
doing in Emerald It's great to see so many people here. And I have to say, uh, some women, uh, not enough yet, in my opinion. Uh, it's almost become a, a kind of personal crusade of mine to get more women involved in participating in this debate. It's vitally important that we take part and we shape it going forward. Um, like Ivan, I'm involved in Business for Scotland. It's quite a big organisation now and growing all the time. We've got about 1,400 businesses and Ivan told you a bit more about it. Uh, the interesting thing though is that, that people that are involved in Business for Scotland are drawn from really every walk of life and every different type sector of business, if you like, as well. And every different type of person imaginable. We've got folk who whisper it are Tories or ex-Tories. We've obviously got quite a lot of Labour people there, we've got some SNP people, we've got some Greens, but most of them, in all honesty, are not really politicians at all. Uh, I wanted to just give you a wee bit of background about myself, and that'll help you understand what on earth has motivated me to come up and come out to these things and chat to people, because it's not necessarily something uh, that I've done throughout my life. I describe myself as always politically aware and never politically active. When I was young and growing up, uh, I was very aware from quite an early age that what I perceived, people wanted to kind of teach me how I should think and basically believe things that, no, uh, no, nah, 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 I'm sorry, I'm just not having that. Uh, when I was in primary six, uh, so I was probably, what, about 10, I remember my teacher at school, when I put up my hand and I said, excuse me, basically, can I ask a really silly question? Uh, she was talking about the Queen and I said, I don't understand why has the Queen got so many houses when other people don't have one at all? And of course, in the manner of schools there, particularly even primary schools, she took me out the front and belted me and said, don't you dare ask a question like that again. <laughs> you know, you'd think I'd learned my lesson uh, because the same teacher was talking about religion and uh, I put up my hand and I said, excuse me, how do you know there is a God and how do you know your God's the right one? Because there are lots of gods. I've been reading a book about it. Well, guess what? Out the front, belted. <laughs> and in some respects, that's, that's the way it was. But what, what it meant for me at that time was that it made me challenging about what people were trying to make me believe and be like and just be in my life, which I basically remember at that time rejecting that. So it made me, as my father would say, a wee bit nebby. And this is what I've kind of, uh, if you like, brought to the, the debate. I remember when I was young and growing up, people did say to me, you know, my kind of peers, when I, I went to the music academy here in Glasgow, were saying, oh, you know, you're always going on about this idea that Scotland can run its own affairs. And how quickly have things to change that now it's common parlance. People are like, yeah, yeah, we were sold a total dud for 30 years. Right from the off, we were told something which fundamentally is not true. Absolutely outrageous. And so when this debate came along, I just really felt, no, I need to stand up and be counted. Because particularly for women, it gives other women permission to say, sorry, enough is enough. I'm not accepting this. So I've ended up getting involved in uh, Business for Scotland. And, and my particular kind of mantra, which I'd like you to just stop and think about for a minute, is... The two sides of the coin, because we have a precious, precious choice on the 18th of September. As Jim here would say, on that day, we hold the sovereignty of Scotland in our hands. It is a precious gift. And I would ask you to think about that very carefully. If we chose to vote no, imagine the message that we are sending out. <coughs> Imagine the message that we are sending out to our fellow countrymen, many of whom are disenfranchised or dispossessed in some way, who are not able, they may have a whole variety of circumstances in their life, they're not able to stand up and come forward like we are. Imagine the message we'll be sending to the rest of the world. There's a marketing agency in London added up the cost in the 24 hours alone in a run-up to the referendum, how much it would cost to buy that airtime for Scotland. And they estimated it was about 800 million to 1 billion just to buy that airtime beamed out all across the world. And on that day is the message we are going to send that we're no more a nation than Shropshire. I think not. 
I know how I would feel if I woke up on the 19th of September and my country, men and women, had not been able to find the strength within themselves to say, no, enough is enough, I'm going to step forward. And that's, to me, what much of this debate is about. When I was growing up and I'd done my primary school stuff, when I was at school, my father got me an interview for a trainee clerkess. And I remember I was really annoyed at him that that was the scope of his ambition for me in my life. And quite frankly, it was because I was his daughter. He did not that ask that of my two brothers. And that sense of confidence to say, no, sorry, I'm not doing that. And we fell out about it. We fell out for a couple of years. I was quite upset that he thought of me in that way. And he was quite upset because I pushed back against him as my father. So we know how it would feel if we said no. But just imagine how it will feel when we say yes. Imagine what we'll be saying to the rest of the world. Those people who've had to leave Scotland's shores to go and find work happens all the time. My son at the moment has just left London has, and has now gone to Paris. Imagine what we'll be saying to all those proud people across the world who have Scottish ancestry. Imagine the message we'll be giving to them. Imagine the message we'll be giving to other nations currently caught up within other states. That yes, you can change and you can make a difference. And it's here, absolutely, in the heart of Glasgow where we can make that difference. We have the power in our hands and that is a precious precious gift so i say to you if you knew if you knew that you could get rid of nuclear weapons just a few miles down the road why wouldn't you if you knew you could help shape a constitution that enshrined the rights of all scots regardless of colour or creed or sexuality, and you could frame out a new Scotland, why wouldn't you choose to do that? If you could choose to create jobs, real jobs, not dead-end, low-wage, going-nowhere jobs for your young people, why wouldn't you choose that? If you could, if you could choose a real democracy where your vote actually made a difference. Why wouldn't you choose that? If you could choose a society that was genuinely fairer and wealthier, why wouldn't you do that? If you could fundamentally choose to shape a message that goes to the rest of the world and the rest of the so many people who've also been dispossessed, disenfranchised and been taught from the earliest age that OK, UK OK was OK. Because I tell you what, UK OK is not OK in any way, shape or form. And we need to get over this thing. It's just the way it is. No, it's not just the way it is. It's just the way things are. No, it's not just the way things could be. So as I was a child told basically, don't you worry your pretty little head about these things. I no longer have a pretty little head. The years have done their toll. But I tell you, I'm not going to, I never accepted it at the time and I'm not going to accept it now. All of us have a duty actually to go out and help shape our community. I want to help shape women. I am a, I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a working businesswoman. And I want to say, yes, go out and tell to, speak to your fellow women. Men, go out and speak to guys. Because sometimes you know what it's like to say, oh, no, I don't want to talk about that. And it's great to see these conversations taking place now. So confidence, I absolutely urge you. It's our time. As Ivan's explained, Scotland can be an independent country. Scotland should be an independent country, fundamentally, for our future and our children's future. It must be an independent country. Thank you. Bill Thompson, President of Scotland, here.
much food for thought there indeed. Um, and uh, in the final part of this this first half uh, of uh, tonight's event, uh, I'll pass it across now to a man who's needs very little introduction. His uh, pedigree is impeccable. A man of great compassion, intelligence, and above all, humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Sellers. It's very important that we put this issue of Scotland in its historical context. We've been part of the English Empire since 1707. And I say the English Empire because that's basically what it was with Scottish, Welsh and Irish appendages. And I've gone through several books and cabinet minutes recently and all the statesmen in the United Kingdom, irrespective of where they came from, describe it as England. In fact, 146 years after the Union, the Israeli making a big speech in the House of Commons talked about England. And if you fast forward to 1948, I've got six volumes in my house of Winston Churchill's memoirs of the Second World War. And it's England, 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 when he means, or technically means, Britain or the United Kingdom. So we've been part of that empire. Every, whoops, every empire, can everybody hear me at the back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Every empire declines. Every one. Whether it's the Persian one, whether it was Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, the Spanish, the Portuguese, we are now witnessing the final decline of the English Empire. For example, you remember the Jubilee, and there was the Duke of Edinburgh dressed as an admiral of the fleet on a wee boat with the Queen sailing up the Thames. Ever wondered why that took place? Every other Jubilee, including Elizabeth's Jubilees, the great piece of event was the monarch sailing up the review of the fleet. It didn't happen this time because there's no fleet to review. <laughs> and that's an indication of the decline. There's two aircraft carriers being built here. The first aircraft carrier, the Royal Navy, has enough folk to put on it to crew one. They haven't got any money to put aircraft on the aircraft carrier. The second carrier, they don't have enough people to crew it. Now, I was uh, in the Royal Navy for five and a half years. In my time, we had a home fleet, a Mediterranean fleet, a Far East fleet, and the West Indies Station. They don't exist any longer. And that's a sign of this decline. So when that fool Cameron comes up here and says, I want you to rest on the broad shoulders of the United Kingdom, which he means England. The man represents a country that's skint. We are heading for £1.5 trillion pounds worth of debt by 2015-2016. They're borrowing at the rate over £100 billion pounds a year at the present time, because they are so weak inherently, they cannot earn their living in the world without borrowing. And there will come a time when that has to end. And I'll tell you this, if we vote no, by the time we get to 2016, everybody who's voted no will bitterly, bitterly regret it. I retired in 1992 from politics, but I've come back out of retirement because I'm a grandpa and I'm an angry grandpa. <laughs> I've got ten grandchildren, ten of them, and when they reach primary seven, I send them a grandpa letter, giving them advice as a grandpa should. I've had to tell each one of them that if we vote no, the prospects in Scotland are so bad. My advice is, get the best qualifications you can get, 
in order to get out because we will be a high unemployment, low wage economy, unequal society for all time coming. And I don't want my grandchildren to live in that kind of society, nor do I want to tell them to get out of it. I want to see a Scotland in which our people prosper as they should, because we are a talented people. Now, I've written a book called In Place of Fear 2. There's some at the back, you can pick it up if you want to read it when you go. And it's in place of fear for two reasons. First of all, an Iron Bevan, who's one of my great heroes, wrote In Place of Fear in 1952. Really for my father's generation, the ones who went through the trauma of unemployment in the 1930s. The other reason is that right now, the Better Together campaign's unofficial but acknowledged title is Project Fear. They want to frighten the life out of you. Now think about it. Who is it we are supposed to be feared to? Am I supposed to be feared to Michelle? Is she supposed to be feared to me? Are we supposed to be feared because we're incompetent, too wee, too small, too stupid and useless to run our own affairs? And it's an antidote to that project fear. It's a socialist program. I make no bones about it at all. I want to see a Scotland independent with a socialist program for the working people and their families. I fought an election in South Ayrshire in October 1974 on the slogan, shifting the balance of wealth and power to the working people and their families. It never, ever happened. And the reason it can't happen, from a Scottish point of view, was pointed out by an old miner at a meeting in 1979, who got up and said in Nether Third and Cumnock, all our socialist dreams have been destroyed by the London connection. And it's true. Think of the present time. A fortnight ago, <coughs> Milliband had an article in the Daily Telegraph, quite safe, because there's no many telegraphs sold up here. <laughs> the telegraph down there is read by the middle class in England. And it was all about his anxiety about their condition and the problems they are facing. If Miliband has to become Prime Minister, he has to get the votes of the English middle class, which means for the Labour Party up here, They've got Middle England on their back. And even if they punt socialism here, when they go down there, they've got to tow the Middle England line. So there's no possibility of any socialist programme if we remain part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Now in my book, I argue for a different economic model than the one we've had up until the present time. I argue for something called resource management. When we look at what we've got and we see how we can build value and wealth upon it. And I start with education. We've got 250,000 children living in poverty in this country of Scotland. They have no chance of a decent education. They are born to fail. We have to do something fundamental because there's a lot of talent among those children. Do you remember the big band playing in the rap lock in Stirling? Up until then, that community thought it had no ability whatsoever. If you go there now, through that music program, you find those children have discovered talent in themselves. Their self-confidence has expanded. They do better at school and the whole community 
feels the self-respect it didn't have before. So we need a program in education that punts more money into our schools. And it can be done without an extra penny being drawn on taxation. We've got 32 education authorities in Scotland, 32 directors of education, 32 bureaucracies. Knock them down to five and 500 million pounds becomes available to transfer into schools. But there's other money as well. Are you aware that the private schools in Scotland get an 80% discount on their council tax? Which means that Fetty's College in Edinburgh, which produced Blair, instead of paying £209,000 in council tax, only pays 41000 Wester Hales in the city of Edinburgh, in a deprived area, 40% of the children on free school meals pays the full whack of 261,000. Now the test of charitable status, because that's what the private sectors get, is public good. Do you do public good? That's the test. Well, Fetty's gave us Blair, <laughs> Govan High gave us Jimmy Reid, and Hamilton Academy gave us Margot MacDonald. Who passes the test of public good? <laughs> One of the things Nye Bevan said is that the instrument, the greatest instrument in the armory of a socialist is audacity. The audacity to think the way they tell you you can't think and the way to act when they tell you you can't act. And I looked at the charities law and the only reason Wester Hales pays that money is because there's a ministerial contact. The government finally funds it. Well, why do we put up with that? You can alter the act, remove the ministerial contact and Wester Hills gets its 80% reduction and every other state school does as well. So there's more money that can be poured into our educational system in order that we bring those children born to fail into a system that actually means that they're born to succeed. Then there's jobs. How do you create jobs? Well, at the moment, they were told that we should rejoice when unemployment's at 6%. I was brought up in a full employment society. We would have been shattered at the idea of 6% unemployment. So I'm arguing for a policy from a socialist government of full employment, because the alternative to full employment is heavy unemployment. And heavy unemployment means that working class people who try to sell their labor in this labor market are in a weak bargaining position. That's why you've got zero hours contracts. That's why you've got minimum wages and folk no paying the minimum wage. If we've got a policy of going for full employment, the bargaining power of the working class increases. Now, how do you create it? We've 157,000 families on the waiting list. There's only one way to house them. Build houses. It's no rocket science. Two and two makes four, building hooses actually puts people off the waiting list. And just think what that programme would do. 25,000 houses a year. You employ the construction workers. You get a real apprenticeship. Folk who supply the goods have more work. And so you expand it and you expand it. And I'll not upset my business colleagues here. But I've got a message for them in a socialist programme. We have almost 340,000 small and medium-sized enterprises in Scotland. They get a raw deal from the banking system. I'm advocating a special bank for them, an SME bank, based on the same principle as the credit unions, a bank that will understand them. I know a small employer who would like £20,000 to expand the business. I said, don't go in and ask for 20000 
ask for 20 million. Now, you might not get it, but you'll get an interview. <laughs> the bonus in 20,000, but there is in 20 million. So we need a small, medium-sized enterprise bank that understands the SME sector. 340,000 companies. Just imagine if half of them employed two more people what that would do to the unemployment, to reduce the unemployment we have at the present time. Then there's the oil, the thing that the big debate was apparently about today. We've been in a prison of lies about oil since the first day the first barrel was produced. <laughs> Gavin McCrone, economic advisor in St Andrew's House wrote a memorandum which said if Scotland was independent it would be a very rich country. That was suppressed, he was no whistleblower and so the people were told an entirely different story. It wouldn't last long, it would go away, can you put all your eggs in the oil basket? That's what the Scottish people were told while the wealth gushed past us into the treasury run by Margaret Thatcher. That's what happened then in this prison of lies. And they're still lying now. Jenny Mara, Labour MSP last week in the BBC debate said it's declining as though that was the end of the argument as far as oil and independence went. Well, listen, there's a difference between X amount of oil for 5 million people and the same amount of oil for 60 million people. Something like 1.2 million barrels a day for 5 million people is more valuable than spread around 60 million. And that's the prospect for us. There's 1.5 trillion pounds worth of wealth in the North Sea. And if we vote no for the second time running, the Scottish people will be robbed blind of that particular wealth. <laughs> it's time that we didn't listen to nonsense. You know, in the 1970s, one of the Labour luminaries, and we Harry Selby, who beat Margot the second time round in Govan, the Labour luminary on television said it couldn't be Scotland's oil because we didn't put it there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when I, I, I worked in the Arab world, when I tell my Arab friends that, they, like, they, they do the same as you. They laugh and they say, we didn't put it there either, but uh, by a so, we're very glad somebody put it there because it was <laughs> So, there's another thing about oil that we haven't really thought about. The actual, all the debate has been about the tax revenues, but what about the black stuff itself? Suppose we took a portion of it and that portion was to reduce petrol, diesel, and aircraft fuel costs. Not a great deal would be required because we are a small country. It would have an enormous beneficial effect upon our transport industry. It would leave more money in the hands of families. It would boost the tourist industry because a lot of our tourism comes from the north of England. Man, Mrs and the Waynes in the car. They hardly go beyond Glasgow and Edinburgh because of the cost of fuel. And aircraft. If we provided the lowest cost of aircraft fuel, we would be able to start attracting more and more companies to give us direct services from our airport. So that oil is a resource that we can actually build upon. And we've not to be put off by this clown talking about his broad shoulders. Now, I'm going to end with an idea in the book. 
which I was told by some friends, not all, don't put it in, Jim. You'll get mocked for the idea. That second aircraft carrier, when it comes to independence and we negotiate the assets and the liabilities, that's not an asset, that's a liability. They don't know what to do with it. They can't sell it to the Argentine. <laughs> <laughs> India doesn't need it. China's building their own. So what do they do with it? Well, I've said, we'll take it. <laughs> Not to use it as a killing machine, but as a he healing machine. There's a ship called the Africa Mercy. 16,500 tons, which goes into Africa, into those areas where people have no decent medical facilities. It's got five operating theatres. It does over 3,300 surgical operations. It cures cataracts for people. And just imagine a poor African with a cataract taken away and can see. It does the cleft palate operations. Just think of an African child in a very poor village who has that handicap and then it's cured. Well, I took that as a model. And I thought, okay, that's a 16,500 tonner. We've got a 70,000 aircraft carrier. Let's turn it into a hospital ship and an international rescue ship. It wouldn't be five operating theatres. We would do a great deal for humanity if we launched that ship. Sailing with a salt tire, not the Union flag, named the Robert Burns after the greatest humanitarian we have in fact ever produced. And if folk want to mock turning a weapon of war into a craft which goes out to heal, then let them mock. What I've tried to do with that and other things is illustrate. We're not talking about Scotland, independent, just being a mini UK going on as it did previously. We're talking about fundamental change in every part of our country and our way of life. Helen Liddell, now Lady Liddell, <laughs> down in the House of Lords, said she was a proud Scot. I'm not a proud Scot. How can we be proud of a country in which a food bank in Glasgow ran out of food. How can we be proud of a country where if you miss an appointment at the job centre, you're sanctioned and you have no money, you have no benefit and you're destitute? How can we be proud of a country where payday loan companies are investing in order to exploit the poor in our society? We can change that if we can mobilise the working class of Scotland. And it is true, if Shettleton turned out 70% and voted yes on the 18th September, they would have a panic attack down in London. <laughs> now my book is an uncompromising argument for a socialist programme for a socialist Scotland. I'm sick and tired of the word hope. We've had hope, 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 and it never happens. I want certainty for my grandchildren and your grandchildren and for the working class of Scotland. We are a talented people. We've been told we're army, but we are. I began life as a milk boy at 11 years old, delivering with a horse and cart. I left Air Academy without any qualifications whatsoever. I went down to the House of Commons in that Oxford debating system, where the other side had a better vocabulary than me. But after I had sat in there for about six to eight weeks, I realised something. I was not only as good as them, I was better than them. I went to the Oxford Union in 1979 in the great debate on the Assembly. And after the debate, I happened to be walking out 
with the President of the Union. And I said to him, where is it I pick up my PhD? <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? I said, because if you are the creme de la creme, my PhD must be waiting in me on the other side of the door. <laughs> we in the Scottish working class have to realise that we can achieve the kind of socialist dreams that we've had for generations and never came to fruition. And at one minute past 10 p.m. on the 18th of September, if we have kept that sovereignty and were sovereign at one minute past 10, the message to the Scottish working class is our time has finally come. Thank you. We will take, uh, we'll take like a 15 minute break and we'll reconvene and we'll get uh, questions from you to, to the speakers here. But some noise in again for Donald and for Ivan and for Michelle and for Jim. Thanks very much.
reconvene now and uh, we'll, we'll start this uh, second uh, just want to take your seats. Um, now, it was suggested to me uh, a minute ago that uh, since, by and large, I'm uh, living out of being a comedian, I should say something funny. Well, uh, I've been asked that all through my career and I refuse to give in to the wishes of the majority. But just a moment ago, I heard a man come, up, come over here and he was speaking to Ivan, uh, a man who was saying that, that uh, across Glasgow, that apparently the, 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 the biggest uh, 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 tranche of no voters is in fact the South Side, uh, which I thought was uh, strange. I, that's where I live. I was brought up not far from here in Toll Cross. That's where I, I spent my days in. But uh, I'll just mention this for a couple of minutes here before we get this Q&A going. The South Side thing. Um, Crawford, who is one of the organisers here, will, will back me up on this. What I've been doing, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the last uh, 18 months, is I've set up a, a movement on the south side of Glasgow, a movement known as the Greater Shawlands Republic. <laughs> yeah. what, what are you laughing at? What, listen, you like this. What we've been doing, I've been campaigning to have the south side of Glasgow become independent for the rest of Glasgow. Just enough, you free yourselves for the York of Glasgow City Council. Do you know what I mean? Gordon Matheson, take the George Square design, shove on what you want. I don't care. <laughs> Well, I had it, and I am the self-styled and democratically elected leader uh, of the party, of the movement. Uh, the, the GSR is what we're known as. Now, uh, and, and we will, of course, I will, of course, when we take power, or rather when we're granted power, uh, we will hand power eventually to, to the people. We will hand power, but only when the conditions are right. And the conditions, I'm afraid, at this point in time, are not yet right. For the, the people are as... Children in the garden of revolution. They are, there's a woman from Tarbert North and she knows what I mean. They are as potatoes in the field of change. And I'm afraid the time is not yet right to hand power to the potatoes. So now I'll be, I'll be touching on this. I'm currently writing my memoirs in my, my DACA in Pollock Park. And I'll be writing my memoirs, but we will hand power to the people eventually. Um, but uh, all those people, uh, the South Side people, and believe you me, I've been walking around. My movement has penetrated the outlying regions on the South Side. We've been to Kings Park, Shawbridge, uh, Govan Hill, we've been to Govan Hill. Although we're not quite sure whether we should get involved in the affairs of a foreign country, but we've been to Govan Hill. <laughs> Have you seen me in Giffnock? <laughs> no, you've not seen me in Giffnock. No, I got chased out of there, man. I went up to Giffnock. We have a campaign team, don't mention Giffnock to me, we were out there campaigning and we thought to them, I'm afraid the people of Giffnock are not quite ready for the message of Southside Revolution. We were surrounded <laughs> by a, a fleet of four by fours out of which jumped a gang of men wearing what can only be described as jumpers. <laughs> <laughs> Who threatened us with golf clubs. <laughs> their wives jumped out of saloon cars bearing tennis rackets. Their children threatened us with Xboxes and PS4s. But we will be back there to give not my friend. We will be back there. We will back there 5,000 strong. We will take battle to the bourgeoisie. We will bring mayhem to the middle classes. And we will burn their tennis clubs to the ground. <laughs> anyway. So you're saying to yourself, well, this GSR you're on about here, big man. What, what are the central planks? What are the central planks? Okay, first of all, equality. We believe in equality for most. <laughs> <laughs> the Equality Committee is going to submit a report in due course, but I've yet to decide who should sit on the Equality Committee. That will happen. And, and by the way, as I speak to you, people, people of the left, you know, people of the centre left, people of the far left, people that's already left, <laughs> people that wish they'd left. <laughs> As I say, one of, one, another thing we're very interested in here is, uh, of course, justice. We of the GSR, are, uh, we firmly believe in the enshrined British tradition that a person accused of a crime is innocent until you can tell just by looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> reform of financial systems, Jim touched upon it. Reform of financial systems, very important. As we know, banks, companies, corporations, institutions, states will take workers' pension funds and use such funds to routinely speculate on the stock market. Now we at the GSR feel we should just simplify the gambling element by putting a whole lot on a horse. 
<laughs> you might as well. Uh, what else we to? We have our own currency uh, 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 solution uh, over in the south side. Uh, when we are uh, autonomous, we will be introduced our own currency. Uh, the pound will be replaced by a unit of currency known as the Pollock. <laughs> Change will be shields. So, that, for instance, at uh, excellent Shelves and Juniors social club prices there, a Jack Downs of Coke would cost you one Pollock and 80 shields. A fiver would be known as a govern. Uh, a tenner is a Michelle McManus, a twenty is a John Martin, a fifty is a Crosma Loof, and guess what? A hundred pound note is a gift knock. <laughs> uh, I was asked why, uh, why I'm going to vote yes. <coughs> My background is, I mean, I grew up just a stone's throw away from here in Toll Cross, and I grew up in, a, in the 60s there. And we, you didn't know you were in poverty until you look back and you go, Jesus Christ, we were, you know, you didn't know. Man, I was 10 year old before they bought me a hat so I could look out the window. I mean, it was bad. <laughs> Ken Dodd, 1976, he'll never die as long as I'm still behind a microphone. Uh, outside toilets, all that, and I saw the changes. I saw it in January 68, remember the storms that just demolished the place. I saw the way that Glasgow's changed a little bit. I saw the sandblasting, I saw the City of Culture here, the Garden Festival. I've seen all of this in my own lifetime. I've seen the rise of uh, a sort of financial district, a bunch of hotels down there along the river. I've seen all of that, but we still see one in four people uh, struggling in poverty in this place. We see now, is it 1.3 trillion in debt in the UK? Ivan, I don't even know how many zeros that is. Uh, 1.3 trillion pounds in debt. Illegal wars, man. We see public money siphoned into private pockets. What someone else described, he said like this, this is not a recession, it's a robbery. <laughs> it's a robbery. Um, I mean, 1.3 trillion in debt. I mean, wh who's doing the housekeeping? Who's doing the Imagine you were at your work and you came back week after week and you gave most of your money to your spouse. There you go, there's the money. And you did it week after week, year after year, decade after decade after decade, and after about 40 years, you turned to your spouse and went, how much have we got? And they went, well, there's good news and bad news. <laughs> what's the bad news? Well, 1.3 trillion pound in debt. Excellent, all right, what's the good news? I'm still looking after the accounts. <laughs> Not good enough. Not good enough. Better together, and we see austerity, and we see cuts better together and we see trillions of pounds of debt better together and we see across the UK attacks on the poor, attacks on the disabled people better together and we see the bankers bonuses still rise even if like Barclays last week they saw a dip in profits. Bankers bonuses still rising while people in the UK, last time I read it was half a million shuffling up the road in their busted shoes in the rain hoping there's some food left in the food bank. Better together. Well, I think this. They could at least have done us the courtesy of naming themselves something less fucking laughable. <laughs> I've got a son. He's 19. He just left the flat uh, about two months ago to go and live with his friend in their flat. He's gone to college. He hopes to go to university. He's got a part-time job. He's 19, 19 and a half, and he's a good lad. And I don't want him to see his future the way that I saw my past. Thanks very much. We, we heard some very, very interesting stuff. It's very passionate stuff from all our four speakers here. Um, I know most of the room is pretty much on site, but I'm sure there are questions that we do want to ask our august guests here. So I open it to the floor, Crawford. Uh, it's going to be going around and about. If you've got a question to ask, it, I'd ask it uh, just as yeah, keep it concise and wait until my mate gets to you and uh, we'll open it to the floor now. Any questions? The man over here with the, with the beard and the green card. What's my green card? I'm a passionate yes voter. Into the, into the mic, please. I'm a, I'm a passionate yes voter and I'm a very distrustful of Westminster. Uh, I should say something in my history. Despite the gob, into the mic, please. Despite the the gob, I've lived and worked, and I've now retired half my life in Scotland. There's one 
Uh, one thing that bothers me, a couple of things that bother me. How is it that there are so many Scottish persons that are, are against this movement and are for the Union? Um, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm 150% I'm by you lot. And I'm, it's not a criticism, but how do we deal with them? I mean, what are they going to do after the independence, when we're independent? I mean, I'm, I'm all for kicking them out completely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what, what should we say to them? I mean, how can you, can you answer that? All right, can I... It's an awkward question, I'm sure. And I don't mean to be awkward. Well, shall, shall I just paraphrase that then? And your yes. friend is asking, why is there such resistance and what do we do about that resistance? Yeah, and I think that, I mean, this is a process, and to be fair, it's something that a lot of people are coming to gradually as they start to take it seriously, think about it, and, um, and look at the information. And people are only going in one direction. Um, so I, I think all the panel, Jim was just talking about it as, uh, during the break, um, in, in terms of campaigns, it's, it's very positive, and everybody on the yes side is pretty confident we're going to win this thing. Um, so people, as they become aware of the issues, and educate themselves about the information around about it, then they're only moving in one direction. Um, can, I also, can I also say, I, I, I find people quite often say, but I need more facts about what an independent Scotland will yeah. be like. And I say, well, what do you mean you need more facts? Um, you know, it's in the future. How do you have facts about the future? You just have to base your um, thoughts about the future on what's happening now. Um, and so, the way people are asking the, the wrong question, and to me, we overcomplicate it. I mean, the question will be asked this September the 18th isn't what currency will you use, or a hundred other questions which are distractions. will be asked, should Scotland be an independent country? In other words, should we run our own repairs? And I think that's, that's a, a judgment question, and we each make a judgment about that. I don't think it's that complicated. We have a number of people in our country who think they are not good enough to run their own affairs. I mean, I've met them. Um, and there's a reason for that. We have been told that generation after generation after generation. When people say too small, too wee, they mean you and me. You know, somehow or other, we do not measure up. And if you keep on that propaganda, decade after decade after decade, then a lot of folk will actually believe it. The subsidised jock. Well, you know, if you keep saying that you know, Scotland's it's subsidised, it's so largess from south of the border, if the newspapers, the media all say that, then there's a whole number of people going to fall for it. I, I took part in the 1979 Assembly referendum. Now that was for a very weak organisation compared to what we are talking about now. And I always remember a new come and it was snowing. A woman walked up and down outside the polling station for about 8 to 10 minutes saying to me, oh, I don't know what today, my boy is employed at Irvine in the Customs and Excise. They had actually got her to believe that somehow or other, if we got an assembly, never mind independence, her boy would lose his job, which meant that they had destroyed the critical analytical faculties of that part of the Scottish psychology. So actually, I am sympathetic and sorry for folk in that condition, because I came out of it a long, long time ago. But they've been kept in it, and the effort now is to keep them in that. When we win, <clears throat> as I'm quite sure we will, then we have to extend the hand of friendship to people who voted no. Yeah. There will be some, there are genuine unionists around. You know, I've, I've got a couple of friends who genuinely are so emotionally tied up, I can't get through to them. Well, we've got to extend the hand of friendship and say, well, the deal's done. You know, here we are, we're going to be independent, we're on Joke Tamsin's Bairns, and we're in this ship together. You have talent, you might not think you have, but you have. And so you must continue to contribute. You are not an enemy. 
We've got to get that across. You are not an enemy. You were an opponent of ours. We won, but there's going to be no crowing. Magnanimity when we win to draw those folk back in to Scottish society and the kind of society that we want to build. Thank you. I'll stand up in the corner over there with the fair hair. Blonde, if you don't mind. Oh, <laughs> uh, my name's Anne McLaughlin and I'm a Yes campaigner. Um, I've got a question particularly for Ivan, but can I just say in answer to the, the, the other questioner that we really have to be careful. There are people in here, and I'm sitting at the back so I know I've seen several people who didn't say they were voting yes. So we need to be careful that we're not criticising people who currently don't know how they're going to vote or are planning to vote no. And the best way that I can find not to get annoyed at people like that is to look at two of the most passionate campaigners for independence we've ever had, and that's Jim Sellers and Dennis Canavan, both of whom at some stage in their lives would have voted no. So I think it's really important, and I think what Jim said was, was really, really important. My question for Ivan, I would vote yes, even if I believed that I wasn't going to get the type of government that I wanted, I personally wanted, because I believe the people of Scotland should make that decision about the Scottish government. However, I'm really pleased that the, the most persuasive arguments that are bringing people to vote yes are the arguments about becoming more left-wing and having more socially just and more socialist policies. But I want to ask Ivan in particular, you uh, have manufacturing companies, you employ presumably a lot of people in this country, and, and I wonder how you make the argument with yourself when you know that when we vote yes, there is a very strong likelihood that those people who work for you will have more rights, they'll have more, more safeguards. We will have a more socially just society which will take some more of that money from you and redistribute it to people who don't have money. How do you square that argument with yourself as a businessman? I'm interested to know because I want to convince other people that are in the same position that you're in and I applaud you for what you're doing but I'm just interested to know how, it, how, how you got to voting yes when you know that probably you're not personally going to be that much better off after independence. You said it was a hard question, I thought you were going to ask about the GDP in Norway or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, there's... Um, it depends how you how you look at the thing, right? If you look at the thing as being a zero sum game, it's us versus them, then you end up where where you where you think you end up, and but that's been part of the problem because the the way the thing's been configured in this country up to now has been largely like that. And if you read Jim's book and you read other stuff and you and, and you look at the whole concept and you look at what the uh, the Common Wheel's talking about, um, and Business for Scotland's done a lot of stuff, and, and I'm talking to. To, to Robin about how we work together on stuff and etc etc because what that's all about is creating a country and an economy that's got um, high technology jobs um, advanced manufacturing moving up the value chain it's not the mass production cheap labour stuff because at the end of the day you, you, business doesn't make a whole bunch of money on that either because you're making pennies right um, because the, the, the price is so low and everything's low low low, low cost um, where you make money as a business, and where uh, it's where you've got a high wage economy, doing high technology, high value added kind of activity, and it's about moving up that value chain. And you've got a country here of five million people. Um, if you are China or India and you're trying to find jobs for a billion people, it's a different kind of scenario. But if you've got a job, a country of five million people, you've got a long industrial heritage, you've still got an education system that is good, should be a lot better, um, especially from an engineer technical point of view. And you've got a lot of initiative going on in a lot of different areas, everything from computer games, life sciences, advanced engineering, whatever. I mean, you've got to be focused on sectors that are going to give you high value, work, high wage, and that's also high profit, frankly. So, I mean, it all stacks up. It's, it's a win-win. Right. Thanks for having me. Right. questions for Fadia? Yeah, I'm, my name's Tony Kenny, I'm part of the Radical Independence Campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, I've really enjoyed this evening, I mean, it, it seemed at first it may be a wee bit in Congress, having kind of socialist speakers and, you know, that kind of thing, but it's worked out really well, it's been great. Uh, the, the campaign I'm part of was called uh, Appalling and, and, and uh, Dangerous Today by Red Tories and Blue Tories, so that's, uh, I mean, that's fantastic, I'm absolutely <laughs> <open>. <laughs> uh, 
All because we're committing the crime, we're reach, reaching out to people who the Labour Party themselves should be representing. And that's uh, we're having the mass canvas in Easter House so on Wednesday night, and we're having an uh, event at the bridge uh, featuring the uh, fantastic Elaine C. Smith. Okay, uh, the question that I want to ask is I actually don't like, and I'm, it's brilliant, it's not even been mentioned once tonight, currency, so I'm, I'm actually criticising something I mentioned myself tonight. I cannot stand how much time is spent on this nonsense about currency. And it, it, it's a criticism uh, of the SNP as far as the fact they're happy playing on the unionist terms because unions have got to do this obfuscation thing because they've got nothing else to argue about because they've got nothing to tell us why we're better together. It's a, it's a total fraud. The whole thing I would love to hear is it's okay talking about social justice, we're going to be a better society, we're going to be more equal. I, I'm not really seeing much evidence of that from the, the main players in it. Uh, I'd love us to be talking about. Uh, Offering people a dignified living wage because that would be a total and utter game changer and it's a no-brainer. I've been arguing for over a year over a year that the places we win independence, and I'm glad that most people have realised it now, is we win it in the housing schemes in the formal industrial areas. And I'm I'm, I'm glad I know yes, I've been speaking to Yes Strategy the last few months. They've finally got a campaign that they're going to target that. I'm so glad you guys are even come in here, even though it, it seemed that I better get into a question. My question is, uh, how do you guys facilitate an ethical uh, a business community? Because you, you are ob obviously ethical people already because you are, you are part of a campaign that is promising uh, a better future for us all. But that kind of thing where they have seen chasing the profit all the time. We don't need to make a profit for the sake of making a profit. People can, no, nobody's concerned about people making a profit. But this thing, we're always making a different, a more and more profit every year. It's hurting us all because... Like we said, Britain got a promotion over the last uh, week or two. They went from the fourth most, most unequal society to the third most unequal society. And it's all about this trickle, failed trickle down economics. So the question is, how can we facilitate this eth ethical business? Thanks. Uh, I'll say something about that first. So uh, what people uh, don't usually appreciate is that I mean, we're kind of taught that business is eternally grasping, it's greedy, it's always about driving do down wage costs, it's always really about raping people to optimise profit. And in reality, I suppose it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that when did we accept that myth? Because frankly, it is a myth. In Scotland, 99.3% of all our businesses are in the SME sector, of which... 98.3% are small, in other words, 0 to 49 uh, employees. That is the nature of our businesses in every town, in every city, in wee streets right across Scotland. That is our business. And yet we've come to believe that business is about this, this horrible other thing. And who's been telling us that? We've accepted that, that myth. So... Uh, what I remember in business growing up was that they were the representatives of all your kind of civic type uh, things like the Highland Games. They were, they were always there. They were in your local magazine. You knew the people in your business and they were part in your community. Those business people, they were there. They were part of it. And I think we've just come to accept that. So to me, it's not such a big transitional shift. It's just reminding ourselves that for a while we put on this kind of lurid purple hat and it's time to take it off and just see things as they, as they really are. Just to, to add to that, just on a sort of final note, this business about uh, kind of playing the no campaign, uh, their own game in terms of engaging in the, in the currency talks or all the rest of it, I think we all need to understand that people are all in a different place in the debate. So the no campaign will keep throwing out scare stories and they're rebutting them. Now, to me, there's something interesting in the manner of rebuttal. The manner of rebuttal is invariably in an adult Based way. They're not getting hysterical about it. They're just saying, no, actually, what you'll find is, oh, passing it back in. No, actually, what you'll find is, and passing it back again. So, over time, if you think about it from an energy perspective, each one of these scare stories is just running out of steam. And what ultimately are they going to come back with? And that's the interesting thing from a strategy point of view, because, yeah, they can keep doing it, but already, even people who still believe at this point in time there are no are going, aye, but have they not got anything better? And you only need to ask, do you mind, help me here. Can you just help can I articulate what your positive vision is for going forward? And to a man, they're unable to do that. So as a strategy, I think it's probably okay. But that, that's my thoughts in business anyway. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you very much. Any questions? Before it?
friend here, uh, and we've got, did we get someone over there as well? Get my man inside just in a second. Get us fella from the centre. Thank you. Hi guys. Um, question I have is regarding the media. Um, I spend a lot, of, a lot of time on Twitter and such like, and that's where I glean most of my information and data about what's happening in this debate, and I'm delighted to see Mr. Siller's part of that uh, ongoing community on Twitter as well now. But when I look at the mainstream media, I don't think there's any newspaper in Scotland supporting independence. Um, the BBC and the Scottish television are a disgrace in terms of their bias coverage. And my biggest concern is I've always got a level of confidence when we talk to people. Um, I think that's a major, major problem and, and how are we going to um, how are we going to overcome that? It's okay having these meetings that are relatively small, but how do we how do we fight that massive machinery of the press and the media that are clearly against this and are spinning stories and obfuscation and lies and goodness knows what? Well, uh, can I jump in here? Um, first of all, I, I believe that television, well, it's still very uh, uh, can be seen to be very influential. I think it's 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 in its death throes. I think it's 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 thrashing around in the waves, and while. Twitter is not the answer to any, anything fundamental at this point in time. It is, as you say there, a source of information, another sort, another way of, of, of getting some information which you wouldn't have had before. I, the question I want to ask is this, why, why is STV, I mean I, th I think the STV and their coverage has been a little more even handed than BBC. To be honest, you see uh, points of being, I mean I'll ask some of the, the difficult questions and we're not hearing them on. Uh, BBC Scotland, you, you just you know, why is there, there was some guy, who was it, Michael Fraser? I heard him refer to uh, the leader of the Yes campaign as Alex Salmond. I think it's a guy called Blair Jenkins, actually, isn't it? <laughs> so the guy's either incompetent or loco or just lying and they don't pick him up on it. So it is a disgrace, but this is the real thing here. This is the real thing because we go out and we talk to our friends, we talk to your sister, and you talk to your, the guy if you're lucky enough to have a job, and you get that debate going there. And that's it's because of that. I mean, if you think of it, the for me anyway the, the, the gains that the yes campaign has, has made in the polls over the last few months and that drop from the nose and this is in spite of the media bias come on so we can trust each other you know we're better than them and they are a disgrace and i'll say that again i don't know what you people think of it yeah, I mean, I'm a bit of a current affairs junkie. I remember a couple of years ago, I was completely fixated on the campaign in the States to re-elect Obama. And it was the same stuff. I mean, he was down in the polls. The Republicans were going at him and calling him for everything. I mean, it was really even dirtier than British politics. You know, they were questioning whether he was even American. They were saying he was a Muslim, a secret Muslim, and his birth certificate had been um, counterfeited. But, you know, that was all this noise on the media. Uh, meanwhile, street by street, town by town, people like you were talking to their neighbours, phoning people up, leafleting, canvassing, and saying to you, I'll help you get to the polling station on the day, and he won. So, I mean, I think we need to take a lesson from that. Each of us has a responsibility to, re you know, to get the people around us thinking, go through the process that we've described, and hopefully come to the conclusion that we could do this and get them to turn out in the day. Can I, um, can I tell you a story from the Vietnam War days? Senator Eugene McCarthy contested President Lyndon Johnson. <coughs> Lyndon Johnson had as much money as he required to buy television and radio in a primary. McCarthy had 3,000 young students. Unknown to the Johnson campaign, they were ringing doorbells and knocking up. They were talking to folk face to face. And when the result came through, although McCarthy actually didn't beat Johnson, he took enough votes off him, Johnson had to pack in and, and give up the presidential race. I am actually quite happy the way things are, because the media, of which we can't do a great deal about, they are concentrating on Alec. And in the meantime, below their radar, are meetings like this in the mass canvas of Easter House. They don't know it's happening. They haven't a clue. And that's a good thing. Because I'm going all over Scotland, the same as Michelle and Ivan are, 
and there are thousands of people working at street level, talking to people in a human way, face to face. And that is having a tremendous effect because five minutes with your neighbour or somebody can overcome any of the propaganda spin you actually get from the BBC. So what's happening is they don't know. And I hope they keep not knowing what happened. <laughs> don't tell them you're in Easter House. We've been in the papers the last few days, they don't know the secret. And I, I was absolutely delighted to see that Margaret Curran was appalled by what the RIC no, were going me. to do. <laughs> and that the Tories said it was hatred on my Twitter thing, which my grandchildren can't believe I'm on, by the way. <laughs> and on my Twitter I said, no, it's truth. And the truth is the thing that's going to get through at street level. Right on, they sir. don't know we are going to win. And that's the important thing. I'm looking forward to a minute past Stop 10. Going on there. <laughs> Our friend over near the window, there, the question. Uh, my question's to Jim, most of it. I just want to say, I agree pretty much with Tony, which is funny because we normally argue quite a bit over Facebook. Tony, I'm Gary Cahill, by the way. How are you doing? Um, what I was going to say, for me, a lot of winning the vote comes to political sectarianism. How do we break that down? How do we break down the sectarianism within politics? That, that, I think that's a, a massive issue, especially amongst the Labour vote. Yep. Well, I can tell you it's not as bad as it was in 1979. Uh, we not only had the Orange Lodge telling folk that home rule was Pope rule, and Protestant organisations going round and all the rest of it, we actually had the CIA and the KGB involved as well, because that was the period of detente, and they didn't want any upset to take place whatsoever. I got very friendly with both the KGB and the CIA. <laughs> we have a sectarian problem in a part of Scotland. It's shrinking. When I was a boy and you went to the dance, the first thing you asked was, are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant? That doesn't happen now. So one of the things we have to understand is the progress that Scotland's made on this sectarianism. Again, it's, it's important that you focus on it, but understand the progress you made. The difference between me as a boy of 17 or 18 and the condition now, the mental condition and the psychological condition is absolutely unbelievable. And as folk here of my age know that's absolutely true. Jim, sorry to interrupt you, um, but a friend's mic did just drop if he's talking about I think I don't know if you political the political sectarianism. Political sectarianism, not not on religious grounds, but oh, on, right. on the basis of the Labour Party and why we're still entrenched in our views when we know that the decision to vote yes is a no brainer. Well you, you have to understand that the best job in the whole of the United Kingdom is being a Westminster Labour MP. <laughs> think about it. Can anybody in here name twelve of them? That's, that's impossible now. You can even ask journalists because they get no coverage. Therefore, there's no focus on them. And they get no great responsibility. Most of the stuff is now dealt with by MSPs at Hollywood. Now, would you want to give up that job? There's an old saying that our fingernails can't reach them in London that can scratch them in Edinburgh. <laughs> so there's a vested interest in them getting a no vote. Also, think of this. Think if you're Douglas Alexander and he wants to be the Foreign Secretary in a Westminster government. You have the veto vote at the United Nations. You've got the Foreign Office, which is a beautiful big building, and because you're a permanent member of the Security Council, even though your country's skint and heading for £1.5 trillion, people beat a path to your door because you've got that veto power. Take him to Edinburgh. There's no veto power. We're five million people and nobody's gone to bother about him at all. 
So from his career point of view, he's got to get a no vote in order to be this big foreign secretary whom people listen to when he speaks. So there's the vested interest you have to take into account. They need the no vote for career and status purposes. I'm looking forward to a yes vote. Just imagine the stair he'd rammy <laughs> when they come up to Westminster and they meet the MSPs up here and they're fighting each other for a seat. It will be wonderful drama. <laughs> Jim, Jim, do you think that the, the left is pulling together as much as it could? No, no. The, 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 the sort of traditional I'm a Labour voter is still there. And one of the things that most people have to say at the start of every meeting is this is not about Alex Salmond and the SNP. Because a lot of Labour voters will not endorse the white paper and they will not vote for Alex Salmond. The tactic of the no side is to glue Alex Salmond to independence so that folk who don't like him from Labour who wouldn't vote SNP will vote no. The Daily Record actually about a week ago uh, was talking about something and it said that it mentioned me on, a, on an, an entirely different matter from Alex Salmond, a, a different point of view. Then it said, but it's the white paper and Alex Salmond we are being asked to vote on. Now, when a Labour voter who is inclined to vote yes, but doesn't like the SNP because there's been a fair bit of tribalism in some parts, West Lothian in particular, for example, then the tendency is to, is, is to stay with what the Labour Party tells you. So we've got six, seven months to break that down. It's, we haven't broken it down yet, but that's one of the things we've got to break down. I mean, what I say is, look, Alex Salmon's mortal, the nation is immortal. Yeah. And it's the nation we're voting for. Yeah. Always fairly immortal. It's fairly immortal. We've got our other friend over here on the side as well. Oh, sorry, we missed one from the back. Sorry, my friend, at the back. Let's see. <coughs> One of the things that's sticking in my throat is this question. <laughs> what is it? One of the things that's amusing you. <laughs> this situation <clears throat> uh, with regards to the currency. Now, we've, we've got a situation being built up around us whereby uh, we are being boxed in through from the arguments of the Better Together campaign suggesting and implying that we could not manage our financial affairs. Irrespective of that, we share a pound of it. We cannot manage our financial affairs. Well, one of the questions that they put to us in that direction with regards to that particular argument is what you want here is X, Y, or Z. Tell us, tell us, Alex Salmond, I mean, it's always Alex Salmond. Where is the money coming from? In the world today, this world has never been so wealthy. It is rich beyond all recognition. The question is, where's the money going to? That's the question. We saw the disaster with the banks. Well, we know the problem with regards to the banks. And we know the subscription that the nation has made to rescuing the banks. And we see the bankers today regenerating the same disaster once again. It's on its way again. The argument at the time that should have been made was yes, we're in a situation which requires the government and our finances to rescue, but the money should not have gone into the banks, it should have gone to businesses and people who are going to generate the basic elements which wealth is based upon. 
but it was a disaster. And with everything that's taken place since then, <coughs> we are in an impossible financial situation. We've been dug into debt for next to eternity. In a way, I wish, I hope, that we don't get involved with the Bank of England and Alex Salmon's forced to renege on our share of the debt. Wait a thought. <laughs> so that's the question about the funding. <clears throat> We've got a lot of other things that have to be taken into consideration here. Because finances are only one element of what we should be thinking about. We're talking about how to create wealth. And a little simple thing that Alex Salmon did make clear was that we could put women back to work, you know, by supplying them with the means by which to do so and collect the taxes from them. Well, fine. <laughs> well, we've all got to pay tax. And, of course, the nation can do with the tax. That is true. But women have got more value than that. And that's another feature that we've got to take into consideration. How do we develop everything that we have before us, to go to the situation in a post a yes vote situation, we have a country which has a blank sheet in front of it. My what are we going to write on it? Yeah, my friend, can I just just ask you to just get to that question there? Thanks for that passion and all that. And just what is the question there for the panel then? I don't have a question, I just made my point. <laughs> 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 ten, ten minutes to go, yeah? Ten minutes to go, and who else we had? Uh, I've got one, two, this man up here, this, so we've got one, two, and then this fella at the front, and then this fella here in the middle there. And if, we, if, we can make, if we can make these questions yeah. as short and sweet as possible. If we can, please. Will do. Um, my question to the Yes campaign really is, uh, what, what are the plan Bs? What happens if you don't get a currency union? What happens if you can't straight away join the European Union? What happens if the markets what lend to RBS and they have to headquarter in, in London? I think, I think that's the reason a lot of people are concerned. It's not just playing to the fear. They want to know what the plan Bs are. They want to know that that's been factored in and there is a plan. Because life doesn't always go to plan. And people want to know what would happen if you don't, for example, get the currency union. No? Is it a plan B? Right. Um, well, in my view, we should have a plan B. Um, if, let's assume, that Alec is right, and that they don't really mean no, and therefore we don't need a plan B, right? And we become independent, or we, you know, we vote for independence, we go into negotiations, and bear in mind that they have a currency, which is internationally recognised as printed by the Bank of England. They have already covered their credit position by saying that they would honour the debt, even if we didn't. So they're in a very good position. We go along and we say, we would like to come in. And they say, well, we said no, but actually now it's yes. Here are the rules. We have nowhere to go if we don't like the rules. We're stuck. And they say, well, it's take it or leave it. And you would have to take it. And I can tell you this, if there's a currency union in which the Bank of England has a say in our fiscal policy, there won't be any left-wing uh, program north of the border because they'll put the Peter on it. Also, there's nine people on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Five of them are drawn from the bank. Four are drawn from nominations by the Westminster government. Six of them are Oxbridge educated. Only one of them has any experience outside the southern part of England. Do we really believe that sending down one Scot from Edinburgh to add to make it ten will make any difference whatsoever? I am not voting on the 18th of September for sovereignty to see it transferred to the Bank of England. That's, so therefore, a plan B is sensible. On Europe, there is a plan B available. It's the European Free Trade Association. Yeah. All Scotland needs is access to the big European market, which includes England, after we're independent. EFTA and the EU signed an agreement in 1994 
to create the European economic area. It's free trade in the single market from Norway right across the rest of the EU. Scotland would fit in very nicely. EFTA is made up of Norway, Switzerland, Iceland and Liechtenstein. We are 5 million people, oil and fish the same as Norway, fish the same as Iceland, which by the way has just said it's withdrawing its application to join the European Union. And if they say in the EU, we don't want you, you're getting pet out and you're not getting back in. Well, already we should be talking to EFTA to say, well, that's all right. If you don't want us, it doesn't matter. But you'll have to take our products because we're a member of EFTA as well. Mind you, I would like to ask them about the cemeteries. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, when um, de Gaulle withdrew France from the military wing of NATO, told the Americans he wanted every American off French soil. Lyndon Johnson told his Secretary of State, ask him about the cemetery. <laughs> Dean Ross was a very polite man, didn't he want to do it, but Lyndon was a hard taskmaster. He met President de Gaulle, who repeated, I want every American off French soil. And he says, does that include those in the cemeteries? The ones who help free France. Now think about it. Holland, Belgium, France, Italy, Denmark, we help their freedom. And does that mean nothing at all to them at all? Does all that mean absolutely nothing? I would ask them about the cemeteries. But if even they say, well, the cemeteries don't matter, plan B is EFTA. And EFTA's a better bet. Because although you have to comply with the EU single market rules, you're free sovereign on foreign policy, you're free on defence policy, you're free on home policy, and you're free on international trade outside of the EU. So I agree with you. It's sensible, in my view, to have a plan A and a plan B. I was a trade union official. I was brought up with Enoch Humphreys from Canvas Line, who taught me the trade. And he said, there's two things, Jim. Always look at what matters to the other side, where their red letters are, so you understand their position. And secondly, never go in with one single point of view, because if you can't get it, you're stuck. Always have contingencies. And this is me, the SNP's campaign. This is very important we understand this. It's not about an SNP election victory on the 18th September. It's about a national victory for us. And we want options for Scotland. We've got to be able to say to the people, they don't like that, we can offer that. <coughs> so definitely, we need plan A, agree, plan B in both that and Europe. Thanks, Jim. We have uh, five minutes left only. Uh, can I go to this fellow here and then? Oh, yeah, well, if you're close to the mic, do you, do you mind me to the oh, final question? Leave me out because the gentleman covered what I was going to. Did he? All right. I've been this, this gentleman in front of his hand up a couple of times. Can we get the mic to him? Sorry. If we can keep this really short and sweet, guys. All right, thanks. Um, the point I just want to make is, in reply to what your, your first uh, guy asked over there, he was asking about, you know, why is there so many Scots? And I thought your man over there was touching on it. I could wrap up and bubble wrap here, you know, but I'll, straight to the point, it is bigotry. There is bigotry in this neck of the world, uh, you know, and no matter what you say, as you, you pointed on as well, you can talk to some people until you're blue in the face. They just want to wave this passport and this flag and say, oh, this is what I am. It doesn't matter what are the, the good arguments and points that you'll make to them. They just see this one thing. Now, I just know everybody, obviously, but I'd like to know what has been done to kind of tackle these people, you know, and say, listen, and trying to put it, because I, I don't believe for a second that every single person that comes under that umbrella, you know, is going to be thinking exactly. I think some of them that are there to be swayed. And it's not only the other side, now, what I would class as my side, there's a lot of people there who, who are a bit worried as well, you know. Things like this, um, it's been in the, the demos and things in the paper, fans against criminalisation and things like that. Now they've got a, a thing against, as it comes back to the SNP and things like that, and they see themselves have been victimised. And a lot of people that I'm arguing with after, after the football and things like that are saying, you know, well we vote for this, it's going to get worse. You know, that, that's where they see that kind of government. What, what's going to be done to tackle these two sets of fans? Because whether we like this or not, 
this is a big issue and this is how people think they think. With a football head, to me, it's a wasted vote, you know, because people are going to think that way. But what, what's been done to tackle these people head on? Because I'm not seeing anything in, in either kind of these communities where people are going and, and asking these people and talking to them and, and doing anything like that on their own doorstep. Well, can I? Oh, unless you got a response to that? Uh, yeah, uh, you might think it's a bit odd coming from me saying how many football games do you go to, but I was commenting tonight when we went to your Celtic Park. Oh, I used to go and watch the games there. Mm. To me, uh, one of the things I used to do in business in large corporate company was try and affect culture change. It's incredibly hard. You always get these kind of grandiose terms about significant transformational change. Very easy to say, incredibly difficult to do. But at the heart of it, that's what this is about. And the thing we need to recognise, it takes time. And although you're challenging that, well, what are we going to do? The very fact that night after night, in location after location, these things are happening. I'm personally attending uh, a great many of them. Is It's symptomatic and evidence of the fact that Scotland at its very heart is changing. So a year ago, who would have believed that you had such a wide overarching yes campaign that encompassed all these elements? So you've got business people sitting in the same platform, freely engaging with people from every side who previously, I remember Alan Bissett said to me when we were talking about one thing, he said, to be honest, I didn't expect to like you. And I said, oh, <laughs> I'll not take it personally, but why was that? And he said, he perceived that because I came from Business for Scotland, exactly as the gentleman was saying earlier, that he thought I'd be all about, oh, it's only about making the money and all the rest of it. And when he actually eyeballed me, and we suddenly realised politically how much we had in common, and we were sharing the same themes around fairness in our society, equal distribution of wealth, and he was like, oh, I just didn't expect that at all. So some of it's about breaking down perceptions, breaking down barriers. This is also, to me, a huge chance for us to do that in Scotland. Because at the point earlier about the kind of politicisation, I personally would like to see much more kind of rejigging of the political landscape. This kind of notion about Labour, various factions versus SNP, even the kind of Tories, you know what? When all's said and done, we need a balance, we need a spectrum in our political debate. And to shake things up is really, really healthy. So I think the change is happening. But it takes time. And when we're talking about people who, uh, you know, the, 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 the very, very first question about um, fear, I suppose, at the very heart of it, when you've been brought up to believe that black is black is black is black, that the union is good, and then somebody starts saying, oh no, see when you're told that, somebody lied to you right from the day you were born. It's incredibly difficult for someone to get over that. And again, it takes time, but it is happening. Uh, it's a whole process, and, and may I say, it's a whole process, classier life, may I say, and if I ever go to football, I tend to go to Ibrox, and, and I know many Rangers fans who get really, really confused if you put a bottle of Blue Nun in front of them. A <laughs> final, because we're running out of time, and a friend here said his hand up. Uh, make it short as I can. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jim, uh, for 1984. Right, your name's no Orwell, I know. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, the, the reason I'm thanking you is because I read your book, uh, Scars on the Case for Optimism. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, some stuck my throat. <laughs> uh, some stuck my throat. Uh, so I thank you for that because uh, the, one, the one paragraph within that uh, book of yours then, over and above the other political issues, was the fact that you stated something that's been very prominent over the campaign, uh, not using it so much today, this whole question of narrow-minded nationalism, right? And I, I have to say immediately that I am delighted that the SNP, right, and it is the SNP, has brought us to this situation, right? And there is a, there is a mindset within the Labour Party, and I'm sure that those in the Labour Party, as you correctly said earlier on, it's a question of opportunism and careerism. People have left the Labour Party over the years, but the point I want to make is this. We have seen since Keir Hardy, John McLean, the UCS campaign. Incidentally, I was at a meeting today with a filmmaker who's making a film in the UCS, where that film showed that working, that, 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 that struggle showed that working men and women working together with correct guidance 
with the correct moral attitude to their fellow workers in the communities can win. And that was a major victory of the last century of the UCS, the major victory. It was airbrushed out of history. However, it's come back, and there's a guy called David Chidlow. He has done the script. I was reading, well, I've read it recently, and I was talking to him today about it. That type of attitude is what we require. But the, the issue I want to raise is this. We have in Scotland two social democratic parties, which are a win-win situation. For the working people of this country, it's a win-win situation. We all have our own independent thoughts in relation to the, 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 the programmes that we would like to see brought forward. In your own book, Jim, your latest book there, I see there was no mention of Trident. I don't know if that was an omission deliberate or not. But is it, do you think it's correct, the platform, that it is two social democratic parties who will put in place a better society in favour of the Scottish working class and take us forward to a new evaluation of our, of our social condition? Right. Um, I didn't put Trident in because what the book says, the, the, I went for the priorities economically. That they, we must tackle the poverty in our society and the lack of jobs. So that's, that's the reason for it. Um, when I wrote uh, the book about optimism, actually I was the only optimist around. I remember <laughs> debating with Donald Dewar who thought um, devolution would never happen again. He thought it was all over and done with. I, I'm not so sure um, that the Scotland that will emerge after the 18th of September will be anything in political terms like the one today. Scottish politics will be turned really upside down. Absolutely upside down. There will be people in the SNP who will leave the SNP if a, social, a more socialist party develops to the left of the SNP. There are young people on the Independence for Labour campaign who are quite determined they have a double agenda. One is to get a yes vote and the second is to change the Labour Party. I'm looking forward to voting Labour in 2016 if it's a socialist party. And I, you know, the, the, this radical independence campaign, does anybody think they are going to go home on the 19th of September? <laughs> there is no chance. All over Scotland at the present time, there are young people <coughs> who have leadership potential, great talent and great ability, whom we don't know. We know they're there, but we don't know who is going to come to the fore in the leadership, but I'm absolutely certain we're going to get a new generation of left-wing leaders emerge out of this campaign because they've been politicised. They have, they have discovered, they have discovered themselves in the political arena. And I reckon that when we come to 2016, it will be more a socialist programme of the kind that I've argued rather than any watered-down one that we've had before. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, we have to wind up now. Uh, I wanted to thank all of you for coming out here tonight, really, because without you guys, this would have been a rehearsal, so well done. Uh, it's been really, really nice, uh, really good. I think we've heard, uh, what we've seen and heard tonight is a lot of optimism and grace, and we hope all you guys will take that optimism and grace with you. Um, so let's hear some uh, appreciation, uh, first of all, for our hosts, Chelsea and Juniors, and for our speakers, John I. Reed, and I will be keen to Joe Carson and John Tillers. And finally, to wind things up, I believe Donald has a quote for us. Uh, yeah, I just want us to, um, well, if you think you can, we can do this again in a couple of months' time, and you each bring a few people, let's think about it. Because um, we need a mass movement, we need people like Gandhi gathering people around them, looking the establishment in the eye and winning. And I'll leave you therefore with a quote from Gandhi. First, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Yeah. Yes.
Hi guys, thanks for joining us on Independence Live. Stay tuned, we will be doing more of the same again.